Have you ever heard the phrase, you can't squeeze blood from a turnip? Apparently, Disney never did, and in their desperation for a mega hit to cover for their legendary losses, they've tried every trick in the book to make up for it. They've broken contractual agreements like they did with Scarlett Johansson after Black Widow. They work a franchise to death like Marvel, or they reactivate long dormant ones like Star Wars just so they could drive them into the ground harder than Riley Reed. And yet, for some reason, they still think that last idea is a good one, and so enter Indiana Jones and the Dial of Dysentery. The story begins with Indiana Jones once again already captured, this time by the Nazis in 1944. Both parties were searching for the Spear of Destiny, and shortly after being revealed, Jones is taken into a tower to be executed while the Spear itself is put on a train for Berlin. And this is where the problems already begin, as an air raid occurs and a bomb is dropped right into the tower where Jones is currently hanging, and then it falls through more floors and explodes, annihilating the Nazis, demolishing the interior of the tower, but Jones is totally fine. I kid you not, Jones is cleaner than Chip Skylark's teeth, and this bomb was several floors below him. Yep. It's that kind of movie. So Jones races off to catch the train and tracks down the spear, only to find that it's actually a fake, because the real one is probably way back in Castle Nuremberg, but whatever. Metal Gear soliding his way across the train, he crosses paths with Dr. Voller, who is obsessed with the titular Dial of Destiny. After knocking him out and rescuing his friend Basil, they are cornered on the train later by Dr. Voller, who is then promptly removed from the equation by catching the wooden beam of a mail hook to the face at roughly 50 miles per hour, and we'll never see him again, right? So with the dial of ruined legacy in hand, we fast forward to 1969. Jones is about to retire from teaching archaeology, believe it or not, and yet again, his relationship with Marion was ended off screen. Yeah, so much for that solid ending in Crystal Skull. Eh, oh well. Anyway, Jones is eventually approached by his estranged goddaughter, Helena, asking him about the dial of colostomy. During the discussion, CIA agents were Working for, to no one's surprise, Dr. Voller attempt to capture Helena in their own hunt for the dial. Helena abandons Jones, and after narrowly escaping them and outrunning a subway train on a horse, Jones is saved by Deus Ex Sala because John Rhys Davies isn't dead yet. After getting Jones to safety, Sala also happens to mention where Helena is because he just knows these things. Yeah, this is going to become a trend in this movie. So he tracks her down to an illegal auction where Helena hopes to make it rich by selling the Dial of Travesty when Dr. Voller and his goons arrive to complicate things more than the Zelda timeline. And after a brief scuffle, Voller makes off with the Dial, while Jones, Helena, and Teddy, who is the replacement for Short Round, get in pursuit, and the chase that ensues is is unbelievable. They're driving on three-wheeled carts at what looks like 50 miles an hour again, and despite making sharp turns to dodge objects like this is Battletoads, they don't immediately crash or cartwheel like Jeremy Clarkson driving the Reliant Robin. After acquiring the Dial of Bad Writing, the trio manage to head to the moon orbiting Endor to locate the Wayfinder. I mean, the Aegean Sea to find the tablet that can point them in the direction of the other half of the Dial of Deja Vu. Out at sea, and in perhaps the only truly unique sequence in the film, Jones and Helena dive down to find the tablet, but are befallen upon by Voller once again, because he is definitely a character and not a plot device that magically knows where they are at all times to move the plot along. After being captured, Helena is given the chance to read the tablet and figures out where the tomb of Archimedes is, and after disabling the boat with TNT, the trio rushes off in the escape boat to find what they're after, while Voller watches through binoculars as they cross the horizon and round the southern tip of Sicily. I'm not kidding, this literally happens during the map travel montage scene, and it fades in Voller saying, they're heading west. Like, do these binoculars have the same zoom as the Coolpix P900? So, in Sicily, Jones, Helena, and Teddy catch their breaths until Teddy gets caught by Voller and his men. With Teddy gone, Jones and Helena decide they're gonna beat Voller to the tomb first. Yeah, that isn't a weird move, but they do so and they find the other half of the Dial of Wokeness, only for Voller and his men to arrive. After they capture them, Again, they put the dial together, but a gunfight ensues. Helena and Teddy escape while Jones stands his ground, and in the process, gets shot in the lung. And it's finally over for Indiana Jones. 
Nah, I'm just kidding. He shrugs a bullet bouncing around in his lungs off a lot better than a cauterized stab wound to the gut. Now having been captured by Voler and his men, he's taken to a hangar and put on a plane that Voler and his men will use to travel through a temporal anomaly. Now, right before takeoff, Helena and Teddy sneak onto the grounds of the hangar, and one of the dumbest things I have ever heard is said, and I'll try to quote it for you now. While hiding behind some barrels, Helena, pointing to a smaller craft, asks Teddy, Do you think you can fly that plane? Teddy then says, I don't think I can. I've never flown that kind of plane before. And then Helena replies, <clears throat> You've never flown any plane before. Then why the fuck did you ask? So the plane goes to take off with Jones, who still isn't patched up. Helena sneaks on through the landing gear, and Teddy manages to follow up behind them. Shortly after takeoff, Voller then finally explains his plan, which is to eliminate Hitler so he can correct the mistakes made, thus allowing Germany to win World War II. Okay, you know what, maybe this is a scrapped Wolfenstein plotline. Either way, once through the portal, both planes have arrived in the skies above Sicily, where they already were. And to be specific, Syracuse during the Roman invasion, and apparently HBO has been around a long time because the Roman fleet starts firing harpoons with pinpoint accuracy into the plane like Euron Greyjoy sniping Rhaegal out of the air. And then, and then the Nazis, I'm not kidding, they open the door to the plane and start firing their handguns at the Roman fleets from the air. I swear to you, this is a true scene. This actually happens, this is on screen, and somebody got paid to make this shit. So, while everyone is just blindly firing at fuck all, Jones and Helena escape the plane, which gets hit a bunch of times and crashes and blows up while they land on the shore. After landing, Helena tries to hurry Jones along so that he could be patched up, but for some reason, Jones decides, nah, leave me here to die. So they argue, and Helena, in order to get him home, punches his lights out. And after presumably a week, everything is fine, and Marion appears, because, of course, they're gonna reconcile their differences again, as this visual defecation finally ends. All right, now that the recap is finally done, let's get into the real meat and potatoes. As you've probably ascertained, this movie is nothing but a ripoff of the previous movies like Dark Fate was to Terminator. Almost every big story beat is hit in order. Now, this isn't to say that formula is inherently bad. Most of life is repetition, after all, like going to the gym, eating dinner, and wanting to rip my fucking hair out after enduring yet another franchise killer. The question is whether or not what is being repeated can be done in a more interesting or unique way, sort of like what Spielberg did with the two Rex scenes in Jurassic Park and The Lost World. The Dial of Dysfunction, on the other hand, decides not to do that and just push rope until falling over asleep because it couldn't give a damn. Oh look, he's captured. Again. Oh look, the Nazis. Again. Oh look, a vehicle chase. Again. Even small details, like the betrayal by an ally, occurs, and I can't help but think this wasn't so much an homage as much as it was blatant plagiarism. And again, with no enthusiasm whatsoever. I mean, the chase scenes are like 80% CGI, 5% action, and 15% fucking talking. And that's because nothing ever seems to want to end. The, the chase scene in Tangier has an extreme amount of inappropriate dialogue that makes no fucking sense. It isn't bad enough that the whole scene is as fake as a plastic surgeon's ward, but you add Jones and Helena having an argument about what he's done in the past or the morality of what Helena calls grave robbing, it just makes me want to kneel in traffic. Oh, but wait, that's not the only reason that this film runs on longer than it needs to. Whenever someone tries to do something simple, they fumble about and don't commit the action. It's weird. Like, for example, there are multiple moments where people have guns pointed at someone and they don't pull the trigger. The best example I can show is actually in the trailer. When Jones is whipping, <laughs> he's ironically whipping all the non-white people in the room, they point their guns at him. After watching this, he realizes, oh shit, and he ducks under the table. When he does this, they fire more bullets into the building behind them than a Detroit drive-by. The issue is he's under the fucking table and the shot holds for like a solid three or four seconds. Why? Why do the most menial of tasks take so long to accomplish? And people wonder why the budget is so high, with scenes that run on and are crammed full of so much CGI it would lag out the grid. Seriously, if you thought Crystal Skull had a lot, this film took that as a challenge. 
Now, the tech has certainly come a long way, and while looking a little rubbery at times, the de-aging tech used on Harrison Ford is pretty fucking good, certainly better than Princess Leia, and leagues beyond Kevin Flynn. Too bad it can't help his voice, since he looks like he's in his 50s again with the tech, but still sounds like he's been smoking with COPD. There is such an excess of CGI, you almost can't believe anything that's on screen. Take the opening sequence of the film, whenever there isn't a close-up of the actors, it looks like it's mostly on green screen. You compare this to the train sequence from Last Crusade, and you can't help but be removed from it because you know there is very little, if anything, tangible on screen. But that's not the only reason for being disconnected, because the characters are by far the worst part of this disgrace. The two leads are the biggest culprits. Jones is just another in the long line of disheveled, broken, and disgraced heroes of old, and I'm sure he won't be the last. If this isn't the most annoying and aggravating cliché in modern Hollywood, I don't know what is. He's a divorced loser who gives up teaching because few people share his interests, and the kernel on top of this shit souffle is that he wants to die. And that doesn't even make sense. I, I, get, I get the reason for the divorce and whatnot, but but you choose to do nothing else? The heroic and persevering Indiana Jones just decides to recline in his chair, wearing nothing but boxer briefs until his inevitable demise, and someone eventually finds his dried-up husk on the chair and someone has to shovel him off because he voided his bowels. Really? Yeah, real great way to go out there, you know? So he just gives up and wants to die in the past because he says, Oh, well, this is what I studied, so let me die here. Like, come on. And the only reason he doesn't is because the forced replacement hits him so hard he literally wakes up 2,000 years in the future. Mike Tyson wouldn't have a right hook that devastating if he were a Kryptonian, because as we all know, modern, strong, independent female characters can never fail at anything and are always the bestest ever. You could drop them off the side of a building and they'll brush it off like they had a little bit of indigestion. This really goes to define how unfitting for this world, or really any other, these nonsensical replacements like Helena are. She's always smarter than everyone around her, including Jones and Voller. She's always right and never gets proven wrong. She's even hornier than everyone else. I'm not making this up. At one point on Puss in Boots' boat, she sees a guy with his shirt off and says, Very promising. <laughs> Are we kidding? You couldn't land him if you used roofies. At one point, she even describes herself as confident, self-sufficient, and beautiful. Bitch, please, you look like you just won the 500-yard woman's freestyle in swimming. Helena is the perfect example of modern writing that no one wants to see in any character. She is the definition of hubris and causes as many problems as she solves. And like so many other films, she can't shine the brightest unless everyone else is dimmed down, because the rest of the cast is totally useless. Mads Mikkelsen as Dr. Voller is totally wasted here. He is paid to stand around and look menacing and teleport to wherever the plot needs him to. You could replace him with a weasel on a hover chair and nothing of value would be lost. Short Round's replacement Teddy sucks all of the fun out of every scene that he's in. He's got as much charisma as a crusty sock. Marion only shows up because I guess she needed a paycheck before she croaks. And Sala is only here because John Reese davies isn't dead, unlike Henry Jones III. Yeah, if you're a fan of Shia LaBeouf's character from Crystal Skull, you are SOL, because he died off-screen in Vietnam, and that is why Jones and Marion are going through a divorce. You know, despite having yet another adventure to strengthen their love, and Jones reconciling his differences with his son, and the allusion to the buff possibly being handed down the whip and hat, all that was thrown out onto a cartridge trap just so Jones could become Luke Baby Whiner. Let it be known that even a solid director cannot save the worst of films, because I am mind blown by the idea that this film was directed and co-written by James Mangold. You know, the guy who did Walk the Line, 310 to Yuma, Logan, and Ford v Ferrari. I don't know what the hell happened behind the scenes, but whatever it is, it must have been horrendous to endure. And all of this in service of killing the last of Lucasfilm's legacy. The dead horse that is Star Wars has been beaten more times than Ken Shamrock, and when Willow was brought back from obscurity, it was put out of commission faster than Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. There is nothing left 
Well, unless someone wants to wokeify American graffiti, I guess, but otherwise, no. And now, with nothing else, they'll have to try and create something, knowing that they don't have a legacy franchise to hide behind. Like, take Spider-Verse 2, for example. It's a Spider-Man movie, so it has a ton of hype behind it. And while it does still have issues, it is still a decent watch. The Flash is an abortion on screen, but at least it got a little bit of heart behind it. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Franchise Implosion is none of these things. It is a committee movie that was reshot and re-edited so many times, it it looks like it resembled the idea of Harrison Ford in his prime in someone's head, but it quickly devolved into Rocky Dennis. And frankly, this franchise should have stayed in the museum where it was. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.